wine pear is now fully ripe, and this is the golden hour for the United States to pluck it. In January 1893, a cadre of powerful white planters, led by Sanford Dole and backed by U.S. Marines, orchestrated a coup with an eye to annexing Hawaii to the United States. Their goal was to protect their sugar interests against changing U.S. tariffs and against Queen Liliokalani, who was showing alarming signs of opposing the strong American influence in Hawaii. Forces within the U.S. government approved the action, wanting to secure American commercial and military interests in the Pacific. Within a few days, a new government was formed, a new constitution was written, and the American flag was hoisted over the government buildings. February brought a treaty of annexation before the Senate, but March brought a new president into the White House, and he approached the development with caution. Resisting a chorus in Congress eager for annexation, Grover Cleveland sent a commissioner to determine the sentiment of the Hawaiian people. When they overwhelmingly indicated that they wanted Queen Lil back, he ordered the Marines back off the island and washed his hands of the whole affair. It was no accident that American interests converged so strongly in the island paradise. Hawaii occupied a strategic position in the Pacific Ocean, marking the western edge of America's sphere of influence. Roughly halfway to China, it was also a convenient way station for Asian trade, a door the U.S. was determined to keep open. Finally, Pearl Harbor, to which the U.S. had gained exclusive rights in 1887, was a compelling military asset. The Hawaiian affair highlighted an emerging struggle in American foreign policy between those who pushed for aggressive expansion and those who questioned the wisdom of acquiring a far-flung empire. Temporarily stymied in the Pacific, the expansionists would nevertheless gain influence in the 1890s. And by the turn of the century, America would assert its place among the nations of the world. The truth is, I should welcome any war, for I think this country needs one. Theodore Roosevelt was part of that generation that were children during the Civil War, that missed out on the war itself. And they spent the next 30 years listening to their fathers and their grandfathers and their uncles and everybody else swap war stories and say what a noble, what a great generation, that generation that actually fought in the Civil War was. Now, was his generation up to the same task? They would only find out when they fought a war, which is what he meant when he said this country needs a war. And he went on to say, I don't really care who it's against. It's just war for its own sake. The circumstances that lead to clashes between nations are many and varied, but certain underlying conditions almost always influence the onset of war. Among these are a heightened sense of nationalism, a strong military, vital economic interests, and a swell of public opinion in favor of the conflict. In the late 1890s, all of these conditions were present in the conflict surrounding a small island 90 miles off the coast of Florida. The United States had wanted Cuba for nearly 100 years. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had talked about how sooner or later the United States was going to take Cuba. Uh, the Cubans rebelled against their Spanish colonial masters. And the first one ended in the 1870s with the United States staying away from it. But in the 1890s, it was different. And it was different because by that time, the United States had about $50 million worth of investments in Cuba. And it was also different because by 1898, the United States now had a new fleet. Uh, this is the fleet that is essentially the beginning of the modern American Navy. You furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. Public opinion, galvanized by the hyperbolic headlines that came to be known as yellow journalism, increasingly swung toward the Cuban nationalists, even as Roosevelt and others beat the war drum in Washington. There were groups in the United States who, who really did 
have a humanitarian interest in the suffering Cuban people. And there were atrocities that had been committed by the Spanish army against Cuban nationalists. There were others who wanted the business of Cuba. There were still others who saw Cuba as a strategically important location in the Caribbean. There were folks like Theodore Roosevelt who had been looking for a war for years. This was the best one on offer and so they were going to snatch it up. Nationalism is important. Militarism is important. Um, economics is important, but they lie there like background. But then what activates this and brings it to life and leads to war is a leader who actually uses them at the right moment to take his people into the war. McKinley has no more backbone than a chocolate eclair. When the crisis comes with Cuba in 1898, there are a lot of people in Congress who very, very much uh, want to go to war immediately. Uh, McKinley does not want to because he knows that we're not militarily ready yet. McKinley wasn't a war hawk. McKinley had fought in the Civil War, as Theodore Roosevelt had not. And McKinley remembered what war involved, and so he wasn't quite so quick to go to war. Furthermore, there were important elements of the Republican coalition that were skeptical about a war. The country was pulling out of the depression of the 1890s, and the idea of a war in Cuba unsettled those people who were making investment decisions. And McKinley is brilliant in delaying and, and, and keeping the war faction in Congress on the defensive and going into Congress on his own terms and on his own timetable, which he does, I mean, right down to the end in April and May of 1898. It seems to me that McKinley is the first modern American president. He controlled Congress uh, in a way that, uh, that nobody had controlled Congress, probably not even Abraham Lincoln had controlled Congress as McKinley did. In February 1898, President McKinley sent an American battleship, the Maine, to the harbor of Havana, ostensibly to secure American interests, to safeguard American nationals who lived in Cuba, but also to impress the Spanish government with the seriousness with which the United States government took developments in Cuba. The, the ship hadn't been there long when it mysteriously blew up. Maine blown up in Havana Harbor at 9.40 tonight and destroyed. Many wounded and doubtless more killed or drowned. The McKinley administration was quick to label this an act of sabotage. Now, in our modern parlance, we would call it an act of terrorism. It enraged public opinion in the United States. Until that time, the events in Cuba had been something between the Spanish and the Cubans. Now, the United States was directly involved. It wasn't impossible for McKinley to avoid going to war after this, but it became increasingly difficult. In April of 1898, President McKinley makes the decision that he has to go to war. And the reason why he has to go to war is because people are telling him that the Cuban revolutionaries are about to win this war on their own. And if they win this war, Cubans are going to control this island and not U.S. officials. Songs were written, bands played, flags waved, and recruitment centers were overrun as public sentiment went over completely for the war, fueled by cries of, remember the Maine, to hell with Spain. Well, those brave black knights who are so bold. Here, the United States had gone to, to war against Spain, and yet many of the soldiers that fought in the Spanish-American War were from New Mexico. As a matter of fact, most of the soldiers that, that um, charged up San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt were Spanish-Americans. And I think that must have been a little bit strange for them. They were going to fight against the, the country where their ancestors came from. So that may have been when they first really started to identify as, as Americans. The military campaign would be short and relatively painless, with few American casualties. Within weeks of the troops leaving Florida, Cuba was taken, the Spanish fleet was sunk, and the American flag was raised over Santiago Harbor. A splendid little war, carried on with magnificent intelligence and spirit, favored by that fortune which loves the brave. 
John Hay famously called this a splendid little war. I think if you ask McKinley, he would have said it was also a necessary war, that it was necessary to, in fact, control an area that was only 90 miles off the U.S. shores and that was very, very important for American strategic interests in the Caribbean. And it finally got Spain out of the Western Hemisphere, which is something the Americans have been wanting to do for 150 years. You may fire when ready, Gridley. Ironically, the first shots of the Spanish-American War had not been fired in Cuba, but halfway around the world in the Philippine Islands, a Spanish colony so remote at the time that even President McKinley had to consult a globe to find it. As in Cuba, the initial military campaign in the Philippines was short and easy. By the end of 1898, the United States and Spain had signed the Treaty of Paris, officially ending the Spanish-American War and ceding the Philippines to the United States. This brought the debate over empire to the Senate floor. We are the conquering race. We must obey our blood and occupy new markets, and if necessary, new lands. The debate in the Senate over the Treaty of Paris was one of the great debates in the history of the U.S. Senate because it came at a time when almost everybody in the United States recognized that the United States was at a crossroads. It could continue in the direction that had gone from the beginning of its national existence, where it focused on events in North America, on events close to home. It remembered that it was a republic, it was a democracy, or it could follow the lead of those who were saying that the United States needed to become an empire. This was at the heart of the question. If we embark upon a career of conquest, no one can tell how many islands we may be able to seize or how many races we may be able to subjugate. Neither can anyone estimate the cost, immediate and remote, to the nation's purse and to the nation's character. Anti-imperialists argued that empire building was inconsistent with the values of a democratic republic. They looked at the world around them and they saw that the great colonial empires were not democracies and they pointed to Germany and Japan and Russia and Britain and France and said, if you want America to look like that, then accept this course of imperialism. But if you want America to look like America, if you want to maintain America's unique position in the world, then do not take this colony because you might make America an empire, but you will destroy the American Republic. We want to send the products of our farms, our factories, and our mines into every market of the world. Make the foreign peoples familiar with our products. And the way to do that is to make them familiar with our flag. For those who favored empire, military and economic interests merged in the argument for annexing the Philippines. If the United States was going to be a great power, it had to have a great big navy. And in the days of steam-powered ships, Navies needed to have coaling stations, places overseas where fuel was waiting for them. And there was coal in the Philippines, and there were harbors in the Philippines that would make great coaling stations. So for those people who had this strategic sense, who dreamed of the China market, the Philippines were an obvious first step in that direction. It seems to me that God, with infinite wisdom and skill, is training the Anglo-Saxon race for an hour sure to come in the world's future. Religion, too, became part of the debate as the concept of manifest destiny was applied to Asia. At the time, you had many Americans determined that it was the burden of the white man to civilize the heathen Chinese, and you had missionaries heading out from all over. Um, interestingly enough, largely women missionaries, over 69% of the missionaries are women. Families that wouldn't have let their daughter travel to Chicago alone, let their daughters go to China to be missionaries. The idea of religion, of spreading a particular set of religious values, wasn't important to everybody. But as in all policy decisions in the United States, you don't have to get everybody signed on for the same reason. And if 
missionaries and their supporters form a small group advocating annexation of the Philippines, for example, as they did. You add that group with groups that are looking to the Philippines for economic reasons, groups that are looking to the Philippines for naval and strategic reasons, you add them all up and you get a majority. The Senate took the fateful step of accepting the Treaty of Paris, making the United States a colonial power, annexing the Philippines to the United States, and transforming the United States from a simple democracy into something more complicated, a democratic empire if such a thing could exist. And the question was, could such a thing exist? I think Mark Twain put it well. He said there are two Americas, one that wants to, to free the colonials and one that wants to keep them colonial. So while we claim to be fighting colonialism, we actually launch an experiment in colonialism. The Philippines would prove to be a much harder nut to crack than Cuba. The Filipinos, once rid of the Spanish, soon wished to be rid of the Americans as well. When they would not leave, a new and brutal guerrilla war broke out, this time between the Filipinos and the Americans. The fighting quickly spread to all the islands, with Americans now fighting the very people they had just liberated. By February of 1899, this is a full-blown rebellion. And it lasts formally for about five years. Uh, and in that war, there's been estimated 200,000 Filipinos were killed. There were 4,000 Americans killed. This turned into one of the really tragic uh, stories in American foreign policy. In a sense, it previews uh, Vietnam. Uh, it previews a lot of the problems that the United States had in dealing with indigenous revolutions throughout the 20th and 21st century. The United States lost what you might call its innocence about the idea of imperialism. Americans had gone into the Philippines thinking that annexing the Philippines would be easy, that the Filipinos would understand that this was for their own good. They would greet the Americans as liberators. When the Filipinos insisted on fighting against Americans, Americans found themselves, that is their, their troops in the Philippines, committing atrocities against Filipinos, very much like the atrocities that Americans had decried when the Spanish committed them against Cuban nationalists just a little bit earlier, then Americans soured on the whole idea of imperialism. By 1905 or 1906, even the enthusiasts among the imperialists had decided that it was a bad idea to have annexed the Philippines. So that Theodore Roosevelt, by now President of the United States, could say, and I'm quoting here, that the Philippines have become our heel of Achilles. The Philippines, rather than being a position of strength for the United States, as Roosevelt had thought, had become a position of weakness. Emerging from the Spanish-American War, the United States found itself in possession of colonies and protectorates from the Caribbean halfway around the world to Asia. With the assassination of William McKinley in 1901, it also found itself with a new president, Theodore Roosevelt. Speak softly and carry a big stick. One of the things he was going to do was to use the U.S. Navy uh, particularly to advance American interests in the Caribbean and in Asia. After the Japanese defeated the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War, Japan emerges as the great power in Asia, and it does have interest in taking over some territory for strategic and economic reasons. And at that point, Roosevelt has to reassess his policy. Is Japan actually a friend? Uh, can we go in by ourselves to stop Japan? In 1907, he does something that's very famous, it's in all the textbooks. He sends this new U.S. fleet around the world, and he does this as a warning to Japan. Japan is to see that the U.S. fleet can move across the Pacific and can make the Japanese behave. Though the fleet made the voyage and returned safely, privately, Roosevelt felt the move did not have the intended consequences and that the U.S. fleet could not project power so far from its shores. He pulled back the U.S. fleet from the Philippines back to Hawaii. 
And he essentially said that anything west of Hawaii was not our affair. This is not well understood. We think of Roosevelt as sort of a wild-eyed imperialist, but he had a very clear sense of the limits of American power. The Caribbean would be a different story and would become the focus of Roosevelt's foreign policy initiatives. Once the United States threw Spain out of Cuba in 1898, once it gained effective control of Cuba, annexation of Puerto Rico, it became the dominant power in the Caribbean and by extension in everything really north of South America. What we find Roosevelt doing uh, in 1902, 1903 is using American military force, particularly the Navy, to extend U.S. power into the Caribbean and into Central America. In 1903, when the Panamanians rebel against Colombia, the Panamanians ask the United States for help, and the United States moves in and gives them help and then takes over Panama and makes a deal with the Panamanians that the Panamanians can govern yourselves, but you've got to give us this strip of land uh, on which we can build a canal. No single great material work which remains to be undertaken on this continent is of such consequence to the American people. As Roosevelt liked to say, he then made the dirt fly. He built this canal, uh, an engineering marvel, uh, and a medical marvel, and clearing out the diseases that had stopped the French and other nations from building a canal here. The Panama Canal turned out to be uh, historic and, and essentially introduce a whole new chapter in American foreign policy for a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason was, if you've got a canal, you can keep the Navy together. You can move the Navy from ocean to ocean as you need it. The second thing uh, that I think is really important about the canal is that before this time, if you were growing wheat in the American Midwest, uh, to get your goods to China, what you had to do was either send it around the tip of South America, which took months and months and months, or you had to put it on trains and move it clear across the American continent, and then on ships. Now you could simply take it down through the Panama Canal and across the Pacific. And this really changed the way Americans related economically uh, to Asia. There was a third implication, and that is that all of a sudden Americans realized they've got something really valuable in the center of Central America. Protecting the Panama Canal was part and parcel of an overall foreign policy goal to dominate the region. When the Dominican Republic threatened to default on its debt to European nations, Roosevelt used the occasion to assert the right of the United States to intervene in the affairs of all Latin American countries. In the Western Hemisphere, the adherence of the United States to the Monroe Doctrine may force the United States, however reluctantly, in flagrant cases of such wrongdoing or impotence, to the exercise of an international police power. This was called the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. And it became a very important policy for the United States through the first half of the 20th century. Uh, what he did was to essentially tell the French, the British, and everyone else that we were now the policemen in this area, and if they wanted to do anything, they had to go through uh, the police station, which was Washington. The first ship passed through the Panama Canal on August 15, 1914, to little fanfare and few dignitaries. The ceremony was fourth page news. War had been declared in Europe, and the guns of August would drown out any celebrations in Central America. The United States, now firmly established as a world power, would soon be faced with the complexities of a world war. In the Western Hemisphere by 1900, the United States was the large power and the rest of the world had to pay attention to that. Americans were beginning to look beyond the Western Hemisphere. Uh, they had undertaken this experiment in the Philippines. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was unclear how that was going to turn out. The one thing that really was clear, though, was that Americans were beginning to consider events that happened beyond American boundaries to have a central and important place in the welfare of the United States itself. I think there was a conflict, a contradiction in U.S. policy. Uh, the, the contradiction 
uh, was one between rhetoric and action. The rhetoric had been since at least 1776 uh, about uh, freedoms and about uh, self-determination. Uh, and the United States had used this rhetoric as it, as it expanded across the continent. When we take over Cuba, what we find is that there's a Cuban revolutionary movement that does not necessarily agree with us. When we take over the Philippines, uh, the Philippines rebel and we have to fight a five-year war against them. Uh, all of a sudden, inalienable rights begin to drop from American political vocabulary. And what you find instead is uh, McKinley, for example, talking about uh, how you uh, go in and civilize these people so they can enjoy certain rights, that they have to go through a certain rite of passage uh, until they mature, is the way he puts it. The rhetoric now is very different. It, once we get outside the continent, and once we get uh, into the position where we have native revolutionaries contesting the U.S. attempt to control their country. I think that there's an interesting parallel between American activities at the end of the 1890s and American activities at the beginning of the 21st century. I believe in the transformational power of liberty. The wisest use of American strength is to advance freedom. So from the very beginning until right now, there is this sense that what is good for the United States is good for other countries and generally speaking, vice versa. As freedom advances, heart by heart and nation by nation, America will be more secure and the world more peaceful. So most American leaders don't see any clear-cut distinction between what's good for the United States and what's good for other countries.